Good day, welcome to Great White Retro. I'm Gord Fessick and this is my bench. Our topic today is a Commodore 16 on loan to us from Roadkill Incorporated. John Bumstead is letting me use this machine in the November Collectorabilia coming up. But in the meantime, we've got some very yellowed keys, a very dirty case, some rusted connectors on the back. And if at all possible, I want to upgrade this thing to 64K so we can run some plus four software on here as well. Let's get her done. Look at this keyboard here. It was missing the seven key when I borrowed it from John, but I was able to get this from a reseller over in Hungary, almost the same place where I got the spare 128 keyboard. The one thing that bothered me on this guy, and this guy is not only the disgusting shape of this case, but <clears throat> yeah, that cartridge port is a bit rusted on the inside. That RF port, I'm not even going to bother with. If I could get away with removing the RF modulator, I would, but I don't think I'm going to. Well, let's at least give it a quick test. I've got a 1571 disk drive hooked up and I was able to write a disk image of an old Compute Gazette uh, floppy disk here. Let's see if we can play something that has some sound, just to make sure the TED chip is working properly. The only thing I found that worked right was this thing called Saloon. Oh, at least we got noise. I'll figure out some way to get joysticks hooked up onto this later. In the meantime, let's get this case apart. You can see that at least two of the three outer case screws are rusted. I am not looking forward to seeing the rest of the case at this point. There we go. Yeah. The corners of the RF shield are rusted. <laughs> the screws holding the RF shield and board in, the, in place are rusted. I'm surprised this thing actually worked. Okay, and with the RF shield removed, let's take a quick look. In the center top is the CPU, just below that is the TED chip, and to the left were some ROMs, and the rest are the RAM and some glue logic. Underneath, we've got that RF shield that's really rusted, and the RF output connector is also rusted. Fortunately, the I.O. is not rusted and it's working. That uh, case shield, however, yeah, we're going to have some fun with that. Now it's time for our new budgeted item for 2023. I ordered a soldering station suitable for vintage computers. This includes a soldering iron and a desoldering pump. I didn't get the one with the, the hot air uh, gun as well. I figured that might be a bit much for vintage machines. But I'm going to read the instructions of this uh, station very carefully. Among other things, I'm supposed to do the initial heat up to 250 Celsius, and then I can tip the, uh, I can tin the tips with a, a tinning paste that came with the kit. I can do this for both the soldering iron and the desoldering pump. I'm just going over that, leaving that in there. There we go. So I'll heat it up to 250 C, and then I'll tin the tip with the supplied uh, tinning compound. While the thing was warming up, I've got uh, to take this thing apart. Let's get those case screws into a container so that we don't lose them. The case screws are rusted, and we'll show you one up close in just a bit. Here it comes. Yeah, look at that. One of these days I'm going to get my iPhone focus working right. 
The C16 comes apart much like a VIC-20. There are hinges on the back and then the case screws are all three on the front there. The keyboard is not compatible with the VIC-20, so don't try to use a VIC-20 keyboard in here. Let's get that horrible RF shield off of there. Let's get that side panel off of there so that we can remove the bottom part of the RF shield. We're going to need to desolder uh, those clamps on the bottom and on the top of the main board. I'm using added flux on my desoldering braid just like I did with the VIC-20. And I'm not going to show you the struggle, but I did get this board free from the RF shield. The cardboard separator looks like it's in pretty good shape too. Next comes the uh, cartridge shield. Again, I got some added flux on there to help uh, wick up the solder. And here I am trying to pry the cartridge shield off of the main board. I got some of it off as you could see. Here I am getting a third leg out of there. In fact, there's my screwdriver not cooperating with me. <laughs> I do eventually get this uh, shield free. A little bit of heat, and there it goes. Next comes uh, the RF modulator. I need to desolder an 8 pin connector and three shield points. I get those with uh, the solder, the desoldering pump. I ended up clogging the desoldering pump, so I had to change the tip, but then I learned how to clean the tip regularly, and I was able to use the desoldering pump much more effectively later on. Just a little bit more, and off comes the RF modulator. I wipe all of the areas I touched with flux with alcohol. Make sure I got all the flux off of there. Now let's take a look inside the RF modulator. It looks fine at first, but you can see that the top is already rusted. I don't know what condition the bottom is, so I'm removing it as well. I can't soak that whole thing in de-rusting solution, so I need to disconnect that RF output connector from the rest of the RF modulator. So here's what we've got. We've got a collection of screws. The heads are mostly rusted. We've got an RF modulator shield where the surfaces are rusted. Got a lid where the surfaces are rusted. We've got a cartridge shield where the surface is mostly rusted. <laughs> We have the underside of <laughs> the RF shield, which is rusted wherever there were vent holes. We've got the top of the RF shield where it's rusted mostly where there was air getting in. And then we have this thing, which doesn't look very rusted. It's the side panel for all of the ports on the side can get that cleaned up, I'm sure. It's not rusted, fortunately. The, the key screws themselves appear to be rusted, so I'm gonna have to remove those as well. Darn. Well, I gotta take this keyboard apart. Look at how yellowed those keys are, except for the seven key that I got, and those badges are in horrible shape. I have a cunning plan to deal with the badges, though, that you'll get to see. Oh my. While we've got our work cut out for us, um, I will use this opportunity to channel my inner David Murray. 8-bit <laughs> guy, please forgive me for what I'm about to do here. This restoration project is not really going according to plan. I've seen more rust on here than I have ever seen on a personal computer before. It's a good thing I got a whole bunch of vinegar for this. And I've been reading on how to do the, the de-rusting. I am hoping to be able to just use a mixture of vinegar and salt to get that. I can see why John Bumstead never really had the time to work on this thing himself. <laughs> wow, you can even see the retro, uh, retro brick. You can even see the yellowing difference on these keys. Well, 
But you know what? In spite of all the rust, all the rust on the screws, all the rust on the keyboard, well, on the back of the keyboard anyway, all the rust on the keyboard screws, all of the rust on the RF shield, and on the RF modulator casing and so forth, I think I'll be able to do well. The plan with the vinegar is to leave everything, and then I'll have to soak the thing afterward in baking soda solution. Fortunately, I've got plenty of baking soda for that. And I'm also going to use some, some electrical rust proofer afterward. Everything a good coat after, so with any luck we'll be able to keep this thing rust free for the rest of its lifetime. After taking everything apart now, at least best as I can, I found that some of the keyboard springs are rusted. The spacebar spring isn't as bad, but there's still some rust on it. The cartridge shield is rusted. The RF output is rusted. The shield on the RF output is rusted. Most of the case screws are rusted. The space bar stabilizer is rusted. <laughs> and of course, the RF shield is rusted. <laughs> to make things even more interesting, half of the keyboard screws are rusted. We've got our work cut out for us here. Let's get the shift lock uh, detached. Let's get this tape off of here. I will replace the clear tape, but not the masking tape. There's no point in that. Yep. I'm going to have to soak all of those little screws in my vinegar and salt solution. And well, <laughs> this is going to take a little while. Okay, yeah, okay. This uh, keyboard uh, circuit board is much like the one from the VIC-20, but they're using carbon-covered uh, contacts this time. Now for the de-rusting. Let's add some salt to this container here. I do have the keyboard spring somewhere else, so don't worry, I haven't mixed them up. Let's get our vinegar in there. There we are. Mmm, salt and vinegar. Yum, yum. <laughs> I don't expect the springs to take very long to de-rust, because they're okay, kind of. Those screw heads are going to be a problem. But we'll keep that sealed. Don't worry, that container is not airtight, so any gases are going to get out and it's not going to explode on me. Here comes the big uh, trouble. Let's get plenty of salt in there. Look at that. <laughs> Alrighty. I ended up soaking this thing in vinegar for two days. We'll see the result after day one. I will loosen the lid once I get this thing in place, don't worry. Shortly after, the next day, I took all of the springs out of the vinegar and salt solution. I put them in a baking soda solution to stop the chemical reaction. Right, that way we don't uh, deteriorate the springs any. Springs are in pretty good shape, even if they're darkened a little bit by the solution. Okay, not bad, not bad at all. Okay. Um, I don't see any change on the RF connector yet. I think a steel brush will take care of that. Just me scraping here uh, gently reveals that most of the surface rust came off of the cartridge shield just fine. Okay, and we'll put everything else in there to let it uh, finish de-rusting. Next comes the big one. Oh boy, here's the horrible RF shield. There's the keyboard spring. We'll get that out of there because it doesn't need to be in there anymore. That's the spacebar spring. All right, so trying to avoid contact as much as I can, I take... Uh, a steel brush to these horrible, horrible spots in an attempt to get the worst of it off. There's no way this is coming off on day one. <laughs> I try to work the edges though as well. 
Some of the parts of the shield are pretty fragile, nor notably in the corners where they've bent uh, some of those uh, screw holes away so it sits flush. There's the spacebar stabilizer, that's in pretty rough shape, but a little bit of wire brushing will help with that. And there we are. That's not bad, it could be better though, so I'll put it back in there for another full day. Here comes the cartridge shield. It uh, came out much better, a little bit of wire brush action and the surface rust came off of there. Unfortunately, I lost the label off of there, but I'm pretty sure John won't mind the lack of the quality assurance labels. There we go. And after a bit of scrubbing, we were able to get the rust off of the RF uh, modulator connector there. Pretty good there. So after letting them soak in baking soda, I am now using this. This was suggested by the local hardware store to, uh, to coat our, rust, our de-rusted uh, things so they don't rust right away. I'm gonna have to find a more permanent solution. I'm experimenting with nickel plating. We'll see if we can do that, but this will do for now. I am using my wire brush on these screw heads one at a time. It is helping. As I scrub them off, I'll put them in the baking soda. There we go, one by one, they all get done, including all the tiny little keyboard uh, screws. My goodness. And finally, after rinsing them, we'll put them uh, in some oil as well. Get the keyboard springs, also get some oil on them. I will wipe them down before I reinstall them. Okay, so we're not there yet, but we've got lots of progress here. Uh, the spacebar stabilizer is in pretty good shape, but um, it still needs a bit of work yet. The corners have got some corrosion still on them here. The top half of the RF shield looks pretty good where it's mostly stuck, whereas where I couldn't get at it with the brush in these corners here, there's some corrosion here. But where there used to be corrosion, there's now these dark spots. It looks awful, but I can feel that there's no bumps. So that tells me that the rust is gone. Top side, you can even see a color change here, right? This is, I haven't soaked this in baking soda yet because I'm going to put this back in the acid bath. And that's because the other half of the RF shield is still in terrible shape. The edges, yeah, I can still feel corrosion here and here and here. But of course the underside is awful yet. Look at this. And this is after some significant scrubbing. So I'm going to attempt some mechanical removal on here with a scraper, before, and then I'm going to put this back into the acid bath and we'll see what happens. So day two, I think it's ready. So I get my baking soda solution ready to go. That container ended up being too small to put the RF shield pieces in. But yeah, let's get those out of there. So I want to I get the hand out of there. Next time I'll use gloves, I promise. <laughs> so we'll give it a, a quick soak in baking soda. I emptied out the acid bath and I just used that. There, let's get that in there. There we go. There, that will stop the acid reaction and hopefully stop it from flash rusting on me. I'm able to get into the corners with my wire brush and so the top half of the RF shield was now virtually rust free. I'll take that. A little bit of scraping here to get the worst of the rust off of here, followed by a wire brush. And well, this looks much better. I might revisit this uh, with uh, some electrolysis kit that I prepared. We'll see. In the meantime, I'm getting most of the rust off of there and we'll go over the spacebar stabilizer one more time. Okay, so you know what? I'll take that for right now. Yeah, this will have to do for right now. And then I'll coat these in liquid wrench again to act as a, a rust proofer for now.
Now, coming back to the RF modulator, I cleaned it up as well, and I reattached uh, the RF modulator's board to its uh, shield case. You can see that uh, RF connector is in much better shape. I also had to use some deoxid on the toggle switch. There we are. So, not bad. It could have been a whole lot worse. Well, let's get it reinstalled into the board. The Composite and S-Video are not going to work without the RF uh, modulator installed because it has pass-through circuits, so we'll have to reinstall it. If I had my way, I would remove this dumb thing, but uh, we'll just have to live with it for right now. It's not my property to destroy like that, so I'll restore the RF connector and the, and the RF modulator, right? but it is not needed. Okay, not bad. Let's uh, do a quick test before we put the cartridge shield on there. Alright, there's one of our LCA or S video cables. And let's see what happens. Oh, look at that. We got a picture. Thank goodness for that. I was a little worried there. That's the S video output, but I'm happy with that. And we got our 16K. It was shaky, but it kind of cleared up over time. Let's see if we can get it to work on any of these. Oh, <laughs> well, it works, kind of. Let's try channel four instead. Yeah, this old TV is just not the greatest. But I care so little for RF modulation, I really don't give a damn. <laughs> okay, well. Yeah, definitely want my composite video over this and my S video. Well, let's get the cartridge shield back on there. That was a lot less of a headache than the, than the RF modulator was. Next is dealing with this keyboard. We'll do some good old soap and water first. I want to let these keys soak before I scrub them, so I set them aside here. And while they're cooking, let's try to clean up the, the keyboard framing. That just needed some soap and water to deal with. Nothing crazy here. Now for, it's time for the case. Well, the condition of this computer is no longer unknown, so that goes away. Let's get these badges off. The power badge came off with just a toothpick uh, just fine. The main Commodore 16 badge was a little more difficult. I had to get in there with a screwdriver, but once I got underneath it, I tried using my floss pick. The black ones are much more effective. This one came apart, <laughs> but I was able to get underneath the badge and remove it without damaging it anymore. <laughs> Now, a good scrub and good old soap and water for this case. There are little white spots all over as though a paint gun caught it. So after I get these with some soap and water, I'll take some baking soda to it to clean up those little white spots. Next comes uh, the serial number badge on the back. I will remove that and I'll tape it back on there once it's all done and I'll clean all that up. So yeah, you can see some of the little white spots here. Usually I'm worried about black spots on a beige case, but it's kind of backwards here. Now, with the keys. We let these keys soak in soapy water for a while. Now we can wipe them all off one at a time. We'll set the 7 key aside because it does not need retrobriting. The others, however, do. So we'll use the 7 key as a control for this. 
Okay, we'll scrub it all off. Then we'll give everything there a good rinse off here. There we go, shake, shake, shake. And using the strainer here. There we go. So what I got here is some black uh, car touch-up paint here. It comes with an abrasive tip for cleaning and it's basically a nail polish applier, except for cars. I'm just gonna douse the power button with it and I'm gonna try to get the edges of the Commodore logo uh, a batch. We'll see how well that goes. I ended up uh, covering all of the silver or at least exposed metal. I tried to use uh, the abrasive part of the, of the car, of the, of the what am I talking about? The abrasive part of the touch-up paint container, which is designed to scrape up these surfaces in preparation for repainting. I end up painting over all of the metal. I try to avoid the, the color bars there. But I was able to get everything else covered up. This actually has two parts. There's a kind of a, a fountain pen part and then there is a brush part. There we go. Just cover the power button. There we are. Next, it's time to get ready for the Retro Bright. Uh, just using uh, tap water here, the temperature got up to 46 or almost 47 C, which is, well, here you go, 115, 117 F. Let's add our hydrogen peroxide, and then we'll wrap the thing up. We're gonna leave it out in the sun for a little while. Again, we're going full David Murray here. <laughs> it's a nice sunny day out, so hey, let's give this a try. Here's the, the southeast corner of the house. It gets the most sunshine, and we'll just leave those out there to cook for a while. All right, we are getting the two RAM chips, this, uh, this bus multiplexer and this bus multiplexer. We're going to attempt the 64K modification while the RetroBrite's going on here. After learning how to use the desoldering pump, I had a much easier time getting those, uh, those joints cleaned up. It did take a couple tries though, again though, but hey. Yeah, I had to go back and try it again. You're pretty much gonna see it, well, it's like, now you see it, now you don't, because I ended up hanging the board over the edge there, and there we go. There goes U8. <laughs> All right, out come the RAM chips and U7. The RAM came out a lot easier than that first part did. My understanding is I need to cut two lines. I need to cut this trace here on pin 2 of U7. That is what's tying that address line to, to 5 volts. So we want to disconnect that and connect it to this pin over here. On the other side of U8 here, we need to disconnect pin 14 from the 5 volt plane as well. It's also being tied high. And we need to tie it to this line over here. These are the two pins that Jan Beta used in his 64K modification. So I added some sockets. These are double wipe sockets, so they're good quality here. Soldered them into place. And yes, I did the trace modifications before putting the sockets in place. I'm not that crazy. I am making sure I don't rejoin those to the 5 volt plane. There we go, we test those, make sure we're not shorting them out. No connection, good, good, good. All right, now we do our bodge wires out to a couple of uh, solder pads out near the CPU. 
These are the same solder points that Jan Beta used, although I got them backwards at first. Can you see the problem there? <laughs> Don't worry. You'll see my escapades of troubleshooting this very shortly. I was rather proud of this until it came out wrong. <laughs> there we go, we'll put our 4464 rams in there. Give this a try. Oh, it's taking longer. Uh oh. Uh oh. That can't be good. Hmm, okay. All right, I just undid the modification and I tied those two pins on the on the LS logic back to high. That got me back to my 16K of RAM. I don't know what happened yet. I think next thing I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna put in the 64K and see if that works at least to get me to 16K, just to make sure the RAM is good. It's possible the RAM isn't good. I wouldn't be surprised, even though I ordered from a North American reseller, who knows where they got the chips from. Also, I'll have the opportunity to test out the spare LS257 chips that I bought. So, this is interesting. Uh, the original parts are LS257s. These ones are LS257N. I don't know what the N stands for, but I'm going to go look that up. What I found out is if I use the N part in U7's position, it doesn't work. If I put an original part in there, and these are actually, these two swapped, then it works. I'm going to have to ask the eBay vendor in question if these are valid chips, or maybe I just picked the wrong part. But at the same time, I've got 4464 RAMs in here, so at least I know that the lower 16K is working. It looks like the plan worked, but uh, not in the way I expected. What I've got is I've got a couple, I've got my jumpers here. Instead of going to these two pins over here on these vias, I've got them plugged directly into the CPU socket. <laughs> um, I don't know how this works. I thought maybe the TED chip needed to access uh, parts of that RAM. It says 60K free for basic. Well, that's encouraging at least. Now I just gotta find a better way to run these lines. Okay, after determining how cheesy that fix was, I went and reconnected the bottom pieces and it turned out I did get the two vias reversed. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. So, Jan Beta's original modification works and it was with uh, the other person's uh, checks that I was able to figure out which pin belonged to which address line off the CPU. So, we should have it this time. <laughs> While that was going on, the keys were getting brightened up. Looks like we're making some progress out here. The outside water hit 51C or 124F in the bright sun. With uh, the 64K modification complete, let's make sure that those bodge wires fit within the RF shield, and it looks okay, not bad. I'll solder that in place here, and after doing that, before I do any more work, I'm gonna test. Yep, there we go. Fortunately, it's all still working. Let's make sure it fits in the case again. Okay, everything's lining up. I'll add some heatsink compound to the TED chip so that uh, the upper RF shield can also act as a heatsink. Some folks have taken to adding heatsinks to a lot of the various parts, but I don't know if that's necessary for this. All right, let's get that all fastened into place, and it looks like the upper RF shield is fitting just fine. All right, let's turn our attention to the keyboard next. Now that uh, the keyboard itself is all cleaned up, we can put all these plungers back. These aren't the same plungers, these have a different coating. And now it's time to put the rest of the keyboard back together. 
With each screw, I am just using a paper towel to absorb any excess oil before putting those screws back into place. I'm hoping that this will help them last a little longer. I don't know if it's possible to even plate these screws. That's going to be interesting, if that's possible. So while I was waiting for the Retrobrite, I decided to take the eraser tip of this, of this detailing of the touch-up paint. This is what I've gotten so far. The power badge uh, came out pretty good, except for the P, which I think uh, was a little bit too much. Maybe bits of the R can be done a little bit better. But even more interesting was how the 16 turned out. 16 turned out really well. I just have a bit of a dip there. I could probably scratch off of there with a sharp blade or something. Now I've just got the whole rest of Commodore's logo to rub off. So the badges turned out pretty good. Let's get these uh, retrobrighted uh, keys sorted out now. There's our control. There's the A key. It's almost a perfect match. There's the up arrow key. That's also a good match. Introducing my revolutionary key layout, the GWR WTF layout. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. Let's get the spacebar stabilizer prepared for reinstallation. Finally, we can put this thing back together. Uh, anyway, we'll start with the spacebar. I had to use a kitchen utensil to snap the stabilizer into place, and after that, it worked out rather well. It seemed like the keys brightened up a little bit in addition, like, so like they matched the control, but then they got a little brighter. But hey, that's okay. They should be fine from here. I'm also wiping off the springs before I install them, making sure they're separated out and making sure that they have their excess oil removed. So there shouldn't be any oil dripping into the keyboard. And the Commodore key, finally. And with that out of the way, let's get this thing reassembled. Starting, of course, with the keyboard and all of those formerly horrible screws that are now... At, if they're not, they're at least not rusted anymore. They're still a little rough, but I don't know how to fix that. I don't know how to regalvanize or replate these screws. That might be a challenge. Eh, we'll see. Anyway, let's put some fresh clear tape on there. I'm not, I don't know what the masking tape was for, my goodness, but at least the clear tape makes a little sense. Next, let's get uh, these two halves made it up here. We'll put some contact cement on here because I'm not going to use double-sided uh, tape on these, not like I did on the VIC-20. The VIC ended up uh, coming apart again and I had to use contact cement, so I'm just going to use it here. But I will use double-sided tape on the bottom label. That was still successful. There we go. Series 264, model 16. There we are. I guess it is a 264 now, isn't it? Anyway, let's uh, get those two, let's get the badges on there. Get the two badges on there. The power one went on there without any hitches. 
Once the contact cement had enough time to air out, it fastened without any problems. Good luck getting those badges off now. <laughs> I did finally receive my nylon replacement badges, but it was just the day after I finished this and I felt proud of this, so I kept these badges on there. There we go. Now you have to get that power LED. I learned from the VIC-20 last time where you put the black ring in there first, you push the LED up from the bottom, and it's a little pressure thing afterward. And there we go, there's the power LED back in place. Now we can close these two halves up. Ugh, my goodness. Hopefully we won't have to open this thing ever again. Let's get some before and after shots now. the work put into this thing and if you ever let this deteriorate into the state I found it I will find you <laughs> in all seriousness on the next episode we'll put this Commodore 264 basically now uh, through its paces we'll get uh, some 64k software running on here and we'll see what we can do with this on the next episode until then good day <laughs>